SpaceX is closing in on Starship Flight 9, with the final round of pre-launch tests underway at Starbase. One of these tests, a six-engine static fire of Starship 35, ended with signs of a potential Raptor anomaly. Let's break down what exactly happened. Ship 35, designated for Flight 9, following engine installation and completing all system integration activities, was rolled out to the Massey's test site early Tuesday morning for its static fire test. The following day, SpaceX conducted a single-engine static fire using a sea-level Raptor. This test lasted six seconds and was described by SpaceX as a demonstration of an in-space engine burn. This burn simulated the type of maneuver Ship 35 will execute during its deorbit phase in Flight 9. Though conducted on the ground, the purpose was to validate engine ignition and stability in conditions that closely replicate space. The main event came on Thursday night with a long-duration static fire. All six engines fired for 30 seconds, longer than most prior tests. This wasn't just for thrust verification, it was a stress test aimed at replicating the suspected conditions behind the Flight 8 failure, where a nozzle-side propellant leak during ascent caused an explosion in the engine bay, ultimately terminating the mission. This long-duration burn was intended to validate the design changes made after that failure, particularly under high thermal and structural load conditions. All six Raptors ignited and maintained stable combustion for most of the burn, performing within expected parameters. However, in the final moments, several anomalies were observed. Bright flashes appeared near the engine section, likely due to rapid ignition events or combustion instabilities. Additionally, the vacuum engines shut down about five seconds earlier than the sea level engines. This difference in shutdown timing raises questions about whether it was an intentional staggered shutdown or an automatic response triggered by onboard systems detecting off nominal behavior. One possible explanation is a Raptor hard stop, a situation where an engine shuts down abruptly due to stress or detected anomalies. Such an event could lead to localized overheating or even cause a small fire in the engine bay, further stressing nearby subsystems. The flashes near the engine section, observed during the engine shutdown sequence, could indicate the ignition of unburnt propellant pockets, likely triggered by thermal gradients or pressure waves as the engines powered down. Alternatively, they could signal hot gas leaks or seal degradation in one or more of the engines. While the engines performed well throughout most of the burn, suggesting that the Raptors are structurally sound and that improvements made after Flight 8 have had some positive effect, the late-stage anomalies indicate that managing shutdown dynamics, particularly for the vacuum engines, remains challenging. Another notable observation during the static fire was the ejection of an object, which could range from a dislodged thermal blanket to a bracket or engine accessory component. Altogether, while no catastrophic failure occurred, the visible mechanical ejection and the inconsistencies in shutdown timing indicate that some systems did not behave as expected. Despite these anomalies, SpaceX has sent the vehicle back to the production site, suggesting they're either satisfied with the test results or require a closer engine level inspection using thermal, vibration, and fault data to rule out any hardware issues. A follow-up static fire remains a possibility if any subsystem shows signs of concern. Once all systems are cleared and the Raptors are deemed flight-ready, SpaceX will proceed with Flight 9. Ship 35's flight partner, Booster 14, which successfully completed its full-duration static fire test on April 3rd, is now undergoing final preparations inside Mega Bay 1. These pre-launch activities include detailed system inspections, functional checkouts, and last-minute upgrades to critical subsystems, all aimed at ensuring the booster is fully flight-ready for the upcoming integrated test flight. Meanwhile, significant progress is also unfolding at the launch site. The launch tower's chopstick arms have undergone intensive actuation tests over the past three weeks, cycling through their full range to verify the performance of hydraulic actuators, mechanical locks, and electrical feedback systems critical for booster capture and stabilization. Engineers also performed rapid back and forth oscillation drills to simulate the transient loads of an actual catch, assess structural response to sudden forces, identify potential resonances, and validate the real-time control algorithms managing the arms during dynamic operations. Interestingly, the launch tower was recently upgraded with a new fire suppression system, featuring high-pressure water nozzles installed near the ship quick disconnect area. These nozzles are aimed at spraying water over the sections of the tower that directly face the incoming booster during recovery operations. The need for this protection became clear during earlier test flights, where the booster's intense exhaust plumes, carrying extreme heat and thermal energy, struck exposed parts of the tower during chopstick captures. This impact risked damaging sensitive internal systems such as hydraulic lines, electrical wiring, sensor arrays, 
and all other essential hardware for the tower's operational integrity. Although SpaceX had previously added protective cladding to shield these structures, experience from three successful booster catches showed that passive barriers alone were insufficient to handle the full thermal load. The newly installed active suppression system will now flood vulnerable areas with water during catch attempts, rapidly absorbing heat, minimizing thermal stresses, and preventing overheating of structural and mechanical elements. In effect, it acts as a dynamic thermal shield, working alongside passive protections to enhance the tower's overall resilience against plume impingement. Elsewhere on the ground side, preparations are underway at the tank farm as well. Damaged hardware from the previous flight is being systematically replaced, while new cryogenic pumps and heat exchangers are being installed. These upgrades are aimed at accelerating propellant loading operations and improving thermal management during tanking. Despite all this progress, the Flight 9 launch timeline now depends heavily on whether Ship 35 is truly flight-ready, especially considering the severity of the static fire anomalies and the possibility of engine repairs or replacements. When do you think Flight 9 will actually lift off? Let me know in the comments below. Shifting the focus to the second launch pad, significant progress has been made at the site in the past week alone. The flame diverter buckets, which were placed into the flame trench on April 12th, are now being integrated with their support systems including plumbing lines and other essential hardware. The top bridge section of the flame diverter was installed above the two buckets a few days ago, acting as a bridge between them. It serves as the first point of contact for the booster's exhaust, directing the plume down into the trench to safely deflect it away from the pad during liftoff. Much of the infrastructure for the water deluge system at pad B has already been completed. The water storage tanks, which will act as the primary reservoirs, were installed several weeks ago near the launch tower. Water from these tanks will flow through a network of underground feed lines, delivering thousands of gallons per second to the flame trench during launch operations. Upon reaching the flame diverter, the water enters internal manifolds housed within the diverter's top ridge. From there, it flows inside the hollow steel pipes that make up the diverter's structure and is sprayed out through hundreds of small precision drilled holes across the surface. This high-volume water flow is critical for protecting the pad infrastructure, absorbing the intense heat, and suppressing the extreme acoustic forces produced during engine ignition and liftoff. While most of the water is routed to the flame diverter, a portion is also directed to the top deck of the launch mount to shield the structure from heat and acoustic loads during engine ignition. Meanwhile, assembly of Pad B's launch mount continues at the Sanchez site. Teams have begun installing the booster hold-down clamps into the mount, with a total of 20 clamps planned. These heavy-duty mechanical latches will secure the booster on the pad before liftoff, ensuring it remains stable throughout critical phases such as engine chill-down, startup sequencing, and propellant loading. In addition, the installation of the water delivery manifolds has progressed. After completing the first manifold on the sides of the launch mount, teams have begun installing the second manifold adjacent to it. The scaffolding that was previously seen around the mount has now been removed, which suggests that most of the work on the launch mount has been completed. Once the current work is finished, the mount will be ready for transport to the launch site. Cranes are being ready to lift and place the launch mount over the flame trench in the near future, and the legs that will support the mount are already in place. Recent observations suggest that the new launch mount is designed for quick replacement. After each launch, the mount can be swapped out, minimizing downtime. Most repair work will happen off-site, keeping the pad clear for the next mission. I've gone in-depth into this replaceable launch mount design in my previous video. Be sure to check it out via the link in the description. Alongside the pad and flame trench construction, teams are performing comprehensive tests on the pad B chopstick arms. These tests include both vertical and horizontal movements along the tower, as well as activating the claws to calibrate the hydraulic and electrical systems for optimal performance. Also, the booster quick disconnect gantry structure is being outfitted with essential hardware, including electrical and hydraulic systems, valves, and manifolds, to support the safe and efficient operation of the quick disconnect mechanism, which is set to be installed in the near future. At the current pace, Pad B is expected to be ready for Starship launches within the next few months. Starship 36, set for the 10th integrated flight test, underwent cryogenic proof testing at Massey's last week. During the test, both the methane and oxygen tanks of the ship were filled to capacity with liquid nitrogen. Meanwhile, six hydraulic rams on the test stand applied force to the aft section of the ship, simulating the thrust of the engines. This comprehensive test allowed engineers to verify the reliability of the ship's plumbing and its structural integrity under flight stresses. After completing the cryo test, the ship returned to the production site, 
where it will undergo engine installation ahead of the static fire test. It's impressive that SpaceX is simultaneously testing ships for both Flight 9 and Flight 10, demonstrating their efficiency and rapid pace of development. Meanwhile, Ship 37 for Flight 11 is fully stacked and currently inside Mega Bay 2, being prepared for cryo-proof testing. Additionally, teams have begun stacking Ship 38, with its nose cone and payload bay assembly recently moved into the facility to initiate the stacking operations. The high bay demolition work is progressing steadily to clear space for the Giga Bay Rocket Integration Facility. The Stargate office building was demolished three weeks ago, and teams have also begun removing the wedge-shaped portion of the Star Factory to expand Giga Bay's footprint. Recent documentation from the FAA indicates that the proposed height for the Giga Bay is now 117.3 meters, which is 1.5 meters, or 5 feet, taller than originally planned. I've gone into detail about the Giga Bay project in a previous video. Check it out in the description for a comprehensive breakdown. In an interesting update, Elon Musk recently shared a key design improvement plan for the Raptor engine. He revealed that the current ugly, unreliable, and heavy bolted flange between the thrust chamber and hot gas manifold will be replaced with a welded joint, a significant change aimed at improving the engine's performance and reliability. This is just one of many enhancements SpaceX is making to the next-gen Starship Raptor V3 engine, building on the thousands of design upgrades already implemented. I've gone into detail about these upgrades in a previous video, link below. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a dramatic turn of events, Firefly Aerospace's Alpha rocket experienced a stage separation anomaly during its latest mission, raising serious questions about vehicle integrity mid-flight. The two-stage Alpha rocket lifted off from Space Launch Complex 2 at Vandenberg Space Force Base on April 29, carrying Lockheed Martin's LM-400 technology demonstration satellite, a mid-sized, multi-mission satellite bus designed to test advanced technologies for military, commercial, and civil use. The launch initially proceeded smoothly, with the rocket's first stage, powered by four Reaver-1 engines, performing as expected. However, trouble began at T plus 2 minutes 30 seconds precisely at stage separation. As the first stage separated from the upper stage, a bright cloud of white vapor appeared, suggesting a possible explosion or rapid release of propellant. Tracking cameras revealed a debris field trailing the rocket, and onboard video from the second stage showed the upper stage lightning one vacuum engine firing without its nozzle extension, with shards of debris visible in the background. Despite this, the upper stage kept ascending, and the lightning engine continued firing for over six minutes, raising hope that the mission could still succeed. Firefly initially announced that Alpha had reached orbit, and that payload deployment would occur as planned. But the optimism was short-lived. Roughly an hour after launch, Firefly posted an update acknowledging a mishap during stage separation that had damaged the second stage's engine nozzle. Three hours later, the company provided a more definitive update, revealing that while the upper stage had reached an altitude of 320 kilometers, it failed to achieve orbital velocity. As a result, both the upper stage and the payload re-entered the atmosphere and safely impacted the Pacific Ocean. The likely root cause appears to be a physical collision between the two stages during separation, possibly due to improper timing or unbalanced thrust vectoring, resulting in catastrophic damage to the second stage engine hardware. The loss of the engine nozzle drastically reduced thrust efficiency, making orbital insertion impossible. This marks Firefly's fourth failure in six Alpha launches since 2021, with only two fully successful missions. Firefly is now working with Lockheed Martin, the U.S. Space Force, and the FAA to investigate the anomaly and has promised to share detailed findings once the review is complete. Meanwhile, please check out my previous video linked in the description to learn more about Alpha, the world's largest all-carbon fiber orbital rocket. Amazon has launched the first batch of its Kuiper Internet satellites, marking a major step toward competing with SpaceX's Starlink in global satellite broadband. The mission, named Kuiper Atlas-1, lifted off on April 28 from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, riding atop the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. After liftoff, the rocket followed a northeast trajectory, eventually placing the 27 Kuiper satellites into a near-circular low-Earth orbit 450 kilometers above Earth at a 52 degrees inclination. Project Kuiper, first announced by Amazon in 2019, aims to deliver fast, affordable internet to underserved and remote regions around the world. The initiative envisions a constellation of 3,236 satellites distributed across 98 orbital planes at altitudes between 590 and 630 kilometers. The satellites feature advanced technologies, including KA-band phased array antennas, 
optical intersatellite links using infrared lasers, and electric propulsion systems for precise orbital maneuvers. Amazon aims to deliver broadband speeds up to 400 Mbps initially, with the potential to reach 1 Gbps as the network matures. The first customer-facing services are expected to begin later in 2025. Amazon enters a market already dominated by Starlink, which has launched over 8,000 satellites and serves about 5 million users. The majority of Starlink satellites operate at altitudes around 550 kilometers, which gives it a natural advantage in terms of latency and signal path loss, both of which scale with distance. In contrast, Kuiper's higher operational altitude, though helpful for wider ground coverage and longer satellite visibility windows, may cause 30% more signal loss at similar frequencies, potentially affecting throughput and latency. Mitigating this may require more powerful user terminals, smarter signal processing, or tighter satellite spacing. Technically, Starlink currently leads in terms of satellite count, global coverage, and proven performance. However, Kuiper's advanced hardware and integration with Amazon Web Services, enabling edge computing, content delivery, and intelligent routing, give it strong competitive potential. Amazon has already secured over 80 launch contracts with multiple providers, including ULA, Blue Origin, Ariane Space, and even SpaceX, to rapidly scale up the deployment of the Kuiper satellite network. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode.